All right. Uh, good morning. So some of you already noticed that we are in a second season of computer architecture. Well, pre, uh, the first season, we mainly focus on performance uh, and also memory. And now the second season, we are going to tell you more about the microprocessor design and some of the future uh, perspective about uh, computer architecture. So uh, because it's a, it's a, we are covering different topics, so I think it's always a good idea to make a new intro video or say an opening video for the class. But before we start, I know it has been a while since our last lecture. And I know you have uh, have a good grasp about uh, the, all the materials uh, before the midterm, but I think it's still a good idea that we should know, uh, we should remind you where are we coming from. So the last time we talk about processor, we say that uh, all the processor right now are so-called pipeline processor. And the the idea of pipelining is that the processor, uh, all the components within the processor are controlled by a single clock signal and including those pipeline elements. So what would happen is that when uh, these elements, they receive a, a, a clock signal, they will move their current intermediate result to so-called pipeline register. And uh, in the beginning of the next clock cycle, uh, the intermediate result will uh, be used to uh, complete the rest of the job. And uh, the previous uh, component that were producing that intermediate result will be yield to another task. So in this way, uh, every component in your processor can work on different tasks. So, uh, in, so, so, so we can fully utilize all the components within the processor uh, and have many, many of uh, many, many tasks or say instructions in flight. And uh, if we do an excellent job, as we can see from this pipeline diagram, uh, for every, after we fill the pipeline at some point, then every cycle we are essentially completing an instruction and turns out that you are having a CTI equal to one plus uh, the, the clock cycle time only needs to be uh, as long as the critical uh, pass of uh, the, 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 the most time consuming component in your processor. So, uh, and so, so you can see like for the pipeline, we can significantly improve the throughput of executing instructions. And that's why this idea has been embraced by old uh, 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 processors since 30 years ago. However, um, most of the time, Time, we are not going to have uh, such a good uh, outcome because we have three different types of hazards and they are structural hazards, they are control hazard, they are data hazard and structural hazard means that we have resource conflict uh, among those instructions or a, a control hazard means that uh, because there is branch, there is a function called, sometimes we have exceptions. So the PC can be changed anytime by an instruction during the pipe. Pipeline. And we also have data hazard means that your instruction may be depending on the result or the outcome of another instruction that hasn't yet been uh, generated by uh, or propagated uh, to the current instruction. So based on this three hazards, and uh, I reviewed your assignment one, and surprisingly, uh, I, I guess it's because you are you are being away from undergrad for than uh, for more than, uh, uh, than, than than a year, so you probably don't remember how to draw a pipeline diagram. So uh, here is the slide that I had for my undergrad computer architecture class, and I cut it exactly uh, as what it is here. So uh, if you don't remember how to draw a pipeline diagram. Here is the tip. So first of all, if it's a five stage pipeline, uh, like those in your undergrad, like the pipeline that we have in your appendix, then uh, every instruction has to go through all five lines, uh, all five pipeline stages. And remember the reason why we want all instructions to go through five pipeline stages is just because we want to uh, avoid uh, the potential structural hazards. And um, then, uh, so, so the first policy is mainly because we have uh, the structural hazards. And the second one, an instruction can enter the next pipeline stage in the next cycle if no other instruction is occupying the next stage. So that is also a structural hazard uh, avoidance, right? So um, if 
if if if if in the next cycle no one is occupying that stage, and uh, then we have done our own work at the current stage, right? And I have all my inputs ready. Why not advance to the next uh, stage, right? So thinking about that, right? Like if there's a job position for you, and uh, you have done all you need to do as a master or PhD student, and you are ready to have all your, you know, uh, uh, like mindset or everything that you need to get that job. Why not take that job, right? So an instruction is like that. So uh, in this way, why not go to the next stage, right? So, and the third policy, you can only fetch a new instruction if we know what's the next PC to fetch. And how do you know what's the next PC to fetch? Most of the time, if the current instruction is not a branch instruction, you know the next PC must be PC plus four. Or if it's a branch instruction, but you can somehow predict the next PC, you can still fetch a new instruction. However, if you are predicting the next PC, whenever you know the branch outcome is different from your direction of prediction, you have to flush that instruction that has been mis, uh, mispredicted. So that's the that's the all the policy that you need to know to draw the line, the right pipeline diagram at this point. Of course, because this is not an undergrad computer architecture class. Later on, we are going to show you a more complex formation of the pipeline. But so far, uh, for the five stage pipeline, uh, that's enough, right? So. Um, well, uh, previously we were talking about how to solve structural hazard, but, but mostly a stall can solve everything. However, it's just so slow. So we just imp so why don't we just improve the pipeline unit design to allow parallel execution? And then we talk about uh, control hazard uh, because of the branch. And as you can see, right, if we have stall, meaning that we have to ins uh, insert uh, implicitly insert two no ops then it turns out that you will have 40% uh, uh, more uh, increase in your uh, average CPI. So that's also not great, right? So uh, we, we start with the first uh, dynamic branch predictor, a two bit by mode local predictor. And by local, it means that we have every branch instruction uh, training its own state. And two bit means that every state only described using two bits. And you can also think about that two bits as the uh, history of the last two branches, or you can consider it as a saturate counter. No matter how you consider it, here is the state diagram, uh, uh, sorry, the state machine for that local predictor is that if we found the equivalent value within uh, that state is uh, more than uh, equal or more than two, we predict the branch to be taken. And if uh, the, uh, the, the actual outcome of the branch is not taken, we decremented the value by one. However, if the the actual outcome is taken, then we increment the value by one. So that's the that's the basic idea of uh, the two-bit uh, bimodal branch predictor. All right. So uh, with the two-bit uh, bimodal branch predictor, uh, we previously learned that well, for uh, uh, for for if you just have a loop, it works well. However, if you have a code like this, and sometimes you do have code like this, then uh, for one of the branch, we can do perfectly almost, and for the other branch, we we are not better than random guessing. Right, so uh, the uh, the overall hit rate we have here is only seventy five percent. So that's definitely not good enough. So today we are going to tell you about some more advanced topics to uh, do a better branch prediction. And I went through all the video regarding all the team scores since uh, the beginning. Of of the quarter and surprisingly we found there is one team right now is leading a lot and um i i was trying to fix the uh the random generator that i have and as you can see in the last lecture is it did improve a lot better right so 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 but i i do encourage other three teams uh you should try your best because we are just half a, we are just halfway through uh, our our quarter, right? And like the song that I just played, it never really overs. So you still have a chance to catch up. All right. 
So let's get the, uh, get started with the lecture today. So today we are going to talk about uh, uh, several different types of uh, uh, advanced predictors. So the first predictor is from a paper that has been assigned, and this is uh, this is a paper from uh, ISCA uh, ninety eight. And ISCA, if you don't know, that conference is the best conference of computer architecture, and. Um, so, so previously we talked about like this two-bit uh, local predictor, right? And we, 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 we say that, well, for this one, right? We always have a hard time of getting this branch X right, right? But however, 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 right? If that's because we, we, we look at the, uh, we, 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 we look at them uh, separately, right? So, but if you look, uh, if you draw the table like this, and if you see, uh, if you look at the, the history of the actual outcome of the branch, ignoring is either from X or Y, right? Then what will happen here is that you will figure out there's always a pattern like this. It's always like one not taken followed by three taken, and then there is no not taken and three not taken. Right, and it's just because the two-bit local predictor, we separate, uh, we separate this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one from the history and trend uh, separately. So there is no way that we can tell uh, there is such a pattern, pattern like that, right? So a, a different source of a of prediction is that okay, let's ignore, let's ignore all the patterns, uh, let's ignore uh, the local history. Let's look at the patterns here, right? Let's look at the patterns here, right? The pattern repeats all the time. So now here's the idea. Can we look at this pattern and use the pattern for prediction? So here comes with the two-bit global history predictor. So the basic idea, well, so here is, uh, is just the PC plus four logic. And then uh, we still have the branch PC and a target PC because we need a target PC uh, for, uh, for the fetching instruction if we predict Hacken. However, instead of having states locally, we do not, uh, we do not have uh, local states. Instead, we have a global history register. And for example, here I have four bits, meaning that I am tracking the last four branch history. And here I put 0, 1, 0, 0, means that um, the last four branch is not taken, taken, not taken, not taken. So now, what I'm going to do is that instead of using the branch PC previously, remember that we use the branch PC and we reference a state, but right now we don't have that state. We, instead of using that, I just use the global history register value as the index of a table. And this table records when the last time I saw this global history register when I need to make a prediction should it be predict taken or not taken? So here I still have two bit states and this two bit states represent, should I predict taken or not taken? And the meaning of the two bit states is still the same as the saturated counter that we talked in the bimodal predictor in a way that if the value is zero or one, we predict not taken. If it's two or three, we predict taken. And uh, so what happened here is that when I receive PC, it's a branch, I would use the target PC if I want to predict taken. But to predict if it's taken or not taken, I am using a global history register. So for example, here we have 0, 1, 0, 0, means that I should reference index number four, which is the fifth entry within this table of states. And uh, if, the value here says one zero, it means that I should predict taken. And uh, the, uh, when, uh, when, when a branch get resolved, we will feedback the, uh, the, the actual branch outcome to the global history register, as well as uh, update this counter, like what we just did before as the bimodal, for the bimodal predictor. So let's have a walkthrough for this predictor now. 
So this is exactly the same code that we practiced before. And now, uh, assuming that the value of i is zero because this is the i is zero and now uh, I am at branch x. And assuming this is the first run of the code and because I want uh, this, uh, this predictor to ramp up faster, so I assume I only have three bit histories, uh, his history, global history. So now everything is zero. So everything is zero, the state is zero, so we predict not taken. However, you know, if, uh, if i mod two equal to zero, it means taken. So the actual outcome will be taken when i equal to zero. So definitely this time we have a wrong prediction, but you know, because the actual outcome is taken. So the next time when you see this zero, zero, the state should be zero, one. Now, let's go to the second branch here, which is branch y. Now i is still, ah, here we go. So uh, here I have a typo because it's plus plus i. So the i should be one here. And now i am branch y. And previous branch is taken. So the global history register is zero, zero, one. And this is also the first time we see this pattern. So the state is zero, zero. And uh, the prediction is still not taken, but you know, because we are going back to the branch again. Uh, to, to the loop again. So the actual outcome will be taken. So we again made it wrong. But you know, the next time when we see zero, zero, one, it should be zero, one state. And now because this is taken, so you can, uh, you can know that uh, uh, now the global history register should be zero, one, one. And this is also the first time we see this global history register value. So it's still zero, zero, pretty not taken. And luckily, uh, because now i equal to one, so it's not taken. So, well, we guess it right, but this is just by lucky, right? So just, uh, just by good luck, it's not really uh, what uh, uh, the branch predictor is making. So you start to feel that, well, this predictor, is it really working? Okay, be patient, right? It hasn't over yet. Now, uh, i equal to two. We are at branch Y and this is not taken. So you know the global history register would be one, one, zero. First time we're seeing this, predict not taken and actually it's taken, right? But you know, the next time we see one, one, zero, it should be zero, one, right? Now, um, let's go to uh, branch X again. And this time I equal to two. So I two mod two equal to zero. So you know this one, it should be taken and the global history register is 101 because the last branch is taken. And again, we didn't see it before, not taken, taken, right? So you start to distrust this uh, uh, branch predictor because so far it doesn't work at all, right? But be patient, be patient. Give me some time, give it some time, right? So now I equal to three branch Y and uh, uh, it's 011 because it's 011 here, right? So, and have we seen this pattern before? Yes, we do, right? It's here, 011. And the state is 00, zero because here we have the zero. And so we should predict not taken. However, very unfortunately, uh, because you are at branch Y, so it's taken. So the next time you should increment it by 01. Okay, we, we, we got it wrong, okay, right? Now, uh, when, 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 when I equal to three, we know that uh, uh, I, three mod two is non zero. So we know this one, even though uh, the previous three are taken, this one should be predict not taken. And we are lucky again. So we predict not taken, not taken, right? But you, 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 you will feel like, okay, this, is not, this has nothing to do with the predictor. We are just so lucky. I agree with that, right? But be patient. Right now, uh, I equal to four, branch Y, and previous history like this. So it's one, one, zero. Have we seen one, one, zero before? Yes, we do. It's right here. And we said it should be zero, one. And still predict not taken, but you know, those ones should be taken. But the positive thing is that the next time we see um, uh, one, one, zero, we will be incrementing it by one. So it will become one zero. So next time we will predict taken if we see this pattern, right? So did you see some lights that this guy would work, right? So now when I equal to four, 
four mod two is zero. So, and the previous three branch is one, zero, one. So have we seen one, zero, one somewhere before? Yes, it's right here, right? So in uh, the last time it's taken, so you know one, zero, one is now zero, one, right? Although predict not taken, but this time is taken. So the next time you will, the, when we see one, zero, one, it should be uh, predicting taken. Now, uh, when I equal to five, um, go to Y again, it's taken. And this time we have zero, one, one. And uh, the last time we have zero, one, one, the history is zero, one, but still not good enough for us to predict taken. Right, so uh, still wrong prediction, but again, the next time it will be one zero. So now I equal to five X. And if you look at that, the pattern will be one, one, one. And the one, 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 the last time is not taken. So it's still not taken and we predict not taken. Woohoo, we get lucky again. That's what you thought. But actually you see every time when we have one, 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 it's always not taken. Oh, you can, we, we have some feeling like, okay, it's going to be not taken in the future as well, right? So now when I equal to six um, for branch Y it's always taken, right? So one, one, zero and one, one, zero. Yeah, we saw this guy here before and we said the next time it will be one, zero. So finally we predict taken and the actual outcome is taken. And because we have a taken, so the next time when we see one, one, zero, the state will be one, one, always predict taken, right? And for six, uh, six mod two is equal to zero and the current pattern is one, zero, one. So one, zero, one, we saw this guy before and now it's, uh, it's one, zero and it said that we should predict taken and the actual outcome is also taken, right? So uh, if you keep iterating like zero, one, one, we've seen this guy before here is one, zero now. So predict taken, actual taken, right? And for this three, because uh, it, the, the real outcome is taken. So the next run of, of seeing them, they will be one, one. So let's see, right now we are at one, 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 right? Because the, the last three, they are all taken. And one, one, one is remains zero, zero because the last time is not taken. And this one still not taken because seven mod two is not zero, right? So it's not taken, right? So see, this one is right, right? And then now let's look at that for now is one, one, zero. Hey, hey, we have one, one, zero here again. And one, one, zero is now one, one. So it predict taken, taken, right? For this one, now our history is one, zero, one. We have that before one, one taken, taken, right? So if you keep iterating, you will find out hoo -hoo, for this predictor, although it takes a lot of time to trend, but after some point, all the prediction, will be perfect. We will perfectly catch, catch this pattern with this predictor, right? So although it takes longer, however, if you have sufficient amount of runs for your code, this one will work, right? All right, so I know it has been a while that you look at those predictors. So I want you to uh, think about What's the advantage of a global predictor over a local predictor?
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now I have sent a screenshot through the chat and please uh, discuss in detail. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so after discussion, here's what I learned from your uh, discussion. It seems like most of you think there are two, correct? So right now, let's pick a team to tell us what does your team think? Oops. Okay, Valor. Can I have some of, uh, who is the scriber for Valors today? Can you tell us what your group is talking about during the chat? Share something. I want to hear something. Uh, hello. Hello. Hey. So our guess is C, and we think um, the first one and the third one should be using global history. The first one and the third one. So why is that? So first one is very similar to the one we just looked at, to the example we just looked at, and we noticed that if you have enough history counting, um, it should outperform local. Okay, so how, what, what, how, 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 what kind of history would be enough from so, your perspective here? You might so what's the difference between the code we have in the first case and the case that we have discussed with? 
So first one, we should have a pattern. Earlier one, we should have a pattern at four, but this one we might need 10 to 20, maybe. But it's right. But much what's longer. the history we have here? History we have here? Like so, what the predictor we have here? How many bits of history do we have? Perhaps. Oh, we have four bit history here. I just noticed. Right. So do you think that's sufficient? Let me see. Oh, that might not be sufficient. That might not be sufficient, right? Because this I mod 10 is zero is equal uh, is is, is, is you need like probably like 20 history to capture that yes. incorrectly predicted case, right? So in this way, if you have four bit global history, the best you can do is probably mispredict uh, one instances over 10 instances here, right? Yeah. So in that way, how does the performance compare with the two bit local? Should be same. Should be the same, right? So uh, this one should be about the same, right? And the second one, who is doing better or do you think they are about the same? Uh, I think local does better. It does, it yeah, local, the same. It oh, well, the it's same, about the same, local. but local would do a better job because shorter it's time easier. to train. Yeah. True. Right. So the third one, you are right. Uh, the global predictor is definitely doing a better job. And how about the last one? Last one it requires, uh, it contains random. Uh -huh. So if it contains random, it should be, um, it makes no sense to track uh, global history. Right, so L could be better in some sense yeah. because uh, the random actually creates some kind of a noise, right? Yeah. So it may make the global history not even working well. Right, so 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 L could be better better in in a case of four. So for this question, surprisingly, right, only one case that. Uh, and thanks for uh, Tim Baylor. And uh, uh, I think uh, although the answer is not wrong, but you identify uh, the mistake in the middle, so I will give you a score. And the 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 thing is that right for this example, you see, well. Uh, it looks like uh, the global predictor can capture uh, can capture the pattern very well, but sometimes the pattern is just so long, and it's impossible for us to capture that, right? And for some cases, there are still patterns that we cannot predict well. So, so the global predictor is not perfect. So we need hybrid predictors. So uh, there are a few hybrid predictors that we can uh, we, we, we will introduce. So the first hybrid predictor is called G-share predictor. So the basic idea of G-share predictor, the G means that it's a global predictor still. However, uh, the share, it means that uh, we, and we, and in a previous example, we see there are some benefits of using local predictor in a way that uh, if you, uh, so, so like the previous one, right? Like the previous one here, right? For this one, um, the, the, if we can, if, if we can kick out this uh, random, right? Um, then simply use the global history this one can still predict very well. Or for this case, right, we, we, um, we, we, can, we can ignore the noise here, then the rest of them should still be working well, right? So how to separate this kind of uh, behavior that uh, we cannot predict well from the case that we can predict well, right? So it's, it's still based on a PC. Right. So if for some branch, we know uh, the global history will work well, but for some branch, we know the global history will not be working well. So uh, the basic idea of G-Share is that we create some kind of uh, additional, we use some kind of additional information, obviously the branch PC to, uh, to separate those global history. So we share all the global history, but we use the local uh, branch PC uh, as an additional uh, information. So how are they going to use that? Is that we, we still have a branch pocket buffer, we still have a global history register, but instead of directly using the global history register to, uh, to index your state's table, we use part of the bits from the branch PC to exclusive or with the global history register. So 
Uh, even though we are at the same global history now, but if you are at a different PC, you will be the aliasing to different locations. So in this case, we are going to 1100 instead of 0100. So, uh, and here it tells us it's predict not taken, right? But the rest of the uh, G share predictor is the same with the two bit logo of global predictor, right? The only difference is that we add the PC here. So in this case, right, if we are having uh, like a branch like uh, 80, right? Because for 80 is zero, zero. So all you, you will go to like a one, one, zero as we used to, right? But in this way you will separate, even though it's the same global history, but if you have an additional bits front, additional bits from the branch PC, they will be trained separately. So that's the basic idea of G share predictor. So it allow the predictor to identify uh, branch addresses, but use global history for more accurate prediction. So that's the G share predictor. And um, another type of predictor. Uh, so, so, uh, so another type of predictor, which is uh, which used uh, very uh, commonly nowadays is called tournament predictor. Right, like the previous multiple choice question, we see for K3, uh, global history is doing a better job. For K4, local history is doing a better job. So the tournament predictor is more about, okay, we have both predictors and uh, they are kind of like two local experts. And for the branch target buffer, we again introduce the idea of local states. However, the states here are not used for branch prediction directly. Instead, it indicates which predictor the last time it gets the right prediction. So uh, it tells you it's a predictor predictor. The first level of the tournament predictor is a predictor predictor. It predicts which predictor to use for branch prediction. Right, so uh, we still have the global history register as a predictor, but we also have a local history predictor here, which has its own local history, which is its own local states. And um, when I have a branch, I would look at what's the state here. And if the state indicates it's one, then maybe I will be using the local predictor uh, uh, so, so, so here I have two predictor and the global history register present zero and the local is one. And I would, so if it says one, then I would use one for prediction, right? And, uh, but the global history register and the local history uh, register, uh, predictor, they could be accessed in parallel. So the tournament predictor is not, uh, it's, it's just add another layer of prediction in a way that we predict which predictor to use. However, this GHR or you can use GShare. And here the local predictor is similar to the bimodal that we have, but you can extend the history to be local. And here I, I show a local history predictor uh, because the tournament predictor was first used by Alpha 21264. And uh, it's a paper that you will learn later. So I make the graph to be consistent with that one, but you can also make a local predictor here to be bimodal. But the point of the tournament predictor is that instead of using just one predictor, let's use that. Let's have a combination of predictors. And uh, the 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 first label, top label, branch target buffer contains a predictor predictor to tell us uh, for the same branch instruction, which predictor uh, get the better performance so far. So that's a basic idea of tournament predictor. Very, I think it's pretty intuitive to understand. So, um, but you know, like those. So, 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 so these are advanced predict. Uh, these are these are these are a combination of different predictors. But can we make global predictor better uh, in a certain way, right? Because uh, right, uh, if you look at the previous question, right, we do have the issue that the global predictor can not work very well uh, if the history is too short. And if you look at uh, the other code that the global predictor can work somehow, each of them would require a different length of history. 
like this one, you probably need uh, because it's a uh, it's uh, it's while plus plus j smaller than two, so you probably need four bits or three bits. And for this one, you you a two bit predictor will work very well, right? And for this one, you really need like a twenty bit predictor, right? So um, so another idea of a, a predictor is that we have a oh, well the animation here failed, but uh, there uh, the the Tage predictor that you 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 read in the paper. The basic idea here is still similar uh, to uh, to 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 the tournament predictor. However, uh, instead of uh, selecting the best uh, type of predictor, the Tage predictor they are all global history predictors. So, uh, but what it uses is that uh, when I have the branch, uh, I interface a branch, right? I still reference a very long global history register. Uh, however, right, the reason why I want to keep a very long global history register is not because I want to use them all. Uh, well, I want to use them all actually, but uh, uh, but uh, I have a few local uh, I have a few other predictors associated with it. Okay, my animation doesn't work very well here, so I just show them all at the same time. So um, so what happened to Tage predictor is that in my branch predictor I have uh, predictors with different lengths of history. So, um, for example, I have the uh, the first predictor. It accepts the lens one. So, for example, the lens one could be uh, two bits. And here I have lens two. It could be four bits or something. And for this one, it could be like eight bits or something. So, uh, in, in the meantime, I also have uh, uh, I also have a state which indicates um, uh, which was the last predictor make the uh, correct prediction. Right, so I use this information and I try to find uh, the longest match of my pattern. So um, if, because, because our, our uh, so, so, so and, and plus this information and use all this information to figure out what was the best predictor to use. So in this way, I can know among this different uh, lens of history, which one would generate the outcome that I really want, right? So for the previous question, if you are having a branch with only two bit of uh, history, then uh, it, 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 it work. Uh, we, we will just use the two bit history, right? And if it's a, if it's a branch that needs 20 bit of history, we may uh, still have uh, the, 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 the one with the longest history. Right, so that's the good thing about Tage. Okay, so Tage is one of the predictors that uh, try to accommodate uh, branches with different um, uh, um, uh, with different uh, different different lengths. Now, another predictor. Some of you might be excited about this, right? Because I know a lot of you are interested about about machine learning, right? Perceptron. So uh, this is also a paper from, uh, uh, this is a paper from HPCA, also one of the best computer architecture conference. And uh, it talks about how to use machine learning or say, well, in general, like I won't say machine learning, sorry. I, I, I think I made a mistake because uh, I will say neural nets, right? To, uh, to make a branch prediction. So uh, the, the reason why I want to co correct my wording is because if you think about, and if you look at the process that uh, we train the machine, uh, the, the branch predictor, machine, uh, the branch prediction is essentially an ML problem, right? You find ways, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, you, find, you find ways to capture uh, you find ways to capture the pattern and you find ways to identify if I should use a counter. And um, so those are like way different ways of uh, class. Well, and so so if, if you think about this way, right? The branch pre prediction is like, we try to grab characteristics of the current branch behavior, even though for uh, local history or global history um, or how many branch has been taken or not taken. Right, for this kind of information, so we find characteristics uh, from 
the current uh, execution of the branch. Use that as an input and make a prediction or say classification if it's taken or not taken. So it's pretty much a machine learning problem, right? So um, there are many, many different ways of doing machine learning, as you know, like random forest, like a uh, tree-based uh, a decision tree, or uh, the the uh, or, or 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 support vector machines, right? But the most pop, uh, the most uh, widely discussed one is probably neural nets. However, if you look at the history of this paper, this is. 20 years ago, a paper 20 years ago, right? So neural nets, a lot of people saying that it's new, it's actually not that new because 20 years ago, computer architects are already trying to use neural nets for branch prediction. So uh, we know neural nets is a way that we can do branch prediction uh, to, uh, to do ML. So how can we use that for branch prediction? That's what the paper is talking about. So the basic idea is that let's map the branch prediction to be an unknown problem. So uh, the inputs to the prediction, uh, perception, perceptron are just the branch outcome history, right? The branch history. And it's just like a two bit uh, branch prediction. And uh, the, the, the history we use could be global or local, right? And conceptually the outcome is just predict taken or not taken, like plus one or minus one. It's, 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 you, you can just like reform your branch prediction problem to be an unknown problem like this, right? And, if, and, and uh, ideally, right, uh, we want each uh, branch to have uh, its own perceptual, right? So that's the basic idea of uh, branch prediction using an unknown. And as many of you know, right, the, 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 whole idea, uh, the whole idea of neural nets is that you have an input, you have an array of inputs or a matrix of inputs. We have weights and there are many layers of multiplications. And, uh, but here, uh, because we are not talking about DNN, we are just talking about NN. So we don't have that many layers. So uh, uh, 20 years ago, here is the available neural nets that we can use at that moment because of the, uh, the limitation of computation technology. So the basic idea is that here, right? We just need to decide the weights and the, the outcome of your branch prediction would be a, a bias first and plus a, a summation of the previous branch history and each bit of the branch history would be multiplied uh, with uh, the weights associated with that bit of branch history. So in this way, we will get our uh, branch outcome. So um, if you look at uh, the, the one that we did terribly for, for, for both branch prediction, right? We said that for a global history, this one may not be working well because of the random is creating noise. However, if you have a perceptron predictor, this one could potential every time when we meet this uh, bit history, we might be able to adjust the weight of it to be just zero, right? So you won't be affected by um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, this kind of randomness here, right? Okay, so look at that, look at that, right? Uh, here's the training history you can find from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the paper, but the basic idea is still, well, we just keep adjusting our weights uh, and then uh, according to the branch history, right? And, uh, and there is a, a, a training threshold when, whenever the tra training threshold is not, uh, is not uh, surpassed this limitation, we keep adjusting our weights. Right, so the dash training algorithm is pretty easy to understand. And uh, here's how the predictor works. So, in, so previously we have states in our table, but now uh, it's a table of perceptrons, or you can say it's a, a table of weight vectors. And remember the weight vectors is, as, is the same lens as your, uh, the history that you want to use for uh, the NN to work, right? So what happened here is that we still have the branch PC for the target PC, and we still uh, and this one is used to for uh, for us to uh, to figure out uh, where to get uh, the target uh, uh, instruction to fetch, and uh, uh, and we still have the global history register, and the global history register is now used is not is now not used to index the table because the table right now is that for each branch PC, we have a weight vector associated with it. 
And um, we, we select a weight vector according to uh, the wet vector uh, vector trend for that branch PC. And then we, uh, we, we compute uh, the, the prediction using a global history with that specific wet vector to generate our prediction. So that's the whole idea of prediction using perceptron, right? So here we have seen uh, many different types of predict uh, predictors that uh, we can use, even though uh, they are all using global history, but we use global history differently. Some of them use uh, the global history plus counter uh, uh, for, for the prediction. Some of them use uh, local history. Some of them use just two bit uh, history to predict, right? So you see, we have a lot of different predictors. So now I want to invite you to think about for among those predictors, uh, if we have limited resource, which one would be the best? All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so for this question, right, let's look at the current discussion in. Uh, well, current uh, outcome it looks like you guys really need some discussion with your friends. So uh, just open the one, the file that I sent out and be ready for a group discussion because I need to reload uh, the, uh, okay. So now go ahead and have a group chat.
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now, well, so let me uh, share with you. This is priority to discussion. And this is uh, after discussion. So now it looks like after discussion of uh, B and E, they are becoming more popular. So I want to invite a group to share your thoughts with us. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like our random generator really want to give Valers a chance uh, to catch up. So can I have a subscriber from Valor can tell me what your group thinks and why do you think you guys uh, get the right answer? Somebody there, somebody there, somebody home, somebody home. Raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, so if bailers are not willing to share, uh, is now open to the public, which team do you want to share your thoughts? Raise your hand. Okay, so I have Jonathan. Uh, I convinced my team that it was E because the paper. So, that, what's your team? Uh, Rocket. Okay, Rocket team. I like that team. <laughs> uh, I convinced my team it was E because when I read the paper on TAG, it specifically mentioned mm -hmm. its best benefit was cost effectiveness and having the same uh, prediction quality as other branch predictors, but with far less memory cost. So, that's why I say e. Yeah, but when I say far less memory cost, uh, do they mention like how, how, how low is that? I do not recall. You do not recall, okay. Okay, oh, I just found from the chat, uh, someone in uh, Valor, they say uh, they, they picked the B, so I want to hear your thoughts about that. So even though, uh, so I, I remember someone in Valor, they, they talked, right? So can you share the thoughts with us? Sure. Okay. So, uh, Hello. So we choose B because B, from our perspective, only takes the least uh, space for prediction comparing to most of the other ones, especially if it's just mm -hmm. two bits. So we think mm -hmm. that but would be where the, can you find the evidence that it works the best? Uh, Hans, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Okay, we do think so here's the thing. Cheap. Right, so here's the thing, right? The answer is right here. If you read a paper carefully, right? Uh, the okay, so so this is actually uh, the the hit the what what you got, right? Perceptron beat versus other techniques, and with only one K, right here, you will see. Uh, the one guy with the best performance is actually by Modo and is way better than others. Well, G share, they are about the same, right? And well, and, and for, for Tage, right? The limitation of Tage is that it needs, uh, it needs, uh, it needs uh, more, more, uh, uh, it needs more tables. So it's, it, it can do, uh, it, it cannot, uh, like it will be around, and it's also based on history. So it will be around the same performance at G-Share or slightly better, but not to the degree like we show here for bimodal, right? And as you can see, Perceptron is actually the worst, right? So that's why Perceptron, the idea seems elegant, seems neat, but 20 years ago, when a paper gets published, nobody really implements per Perceptron in their processor because uh, Moore's law doesn't allow us to put a lot of uh, 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 overheads in branch prediction. And there are some other places that we should put our logics to. So Perceptron was the 
um, uh, the the perceptron was not uh, uh, was not an idea that uh, is a is a neat idea, but it's too early at that time. But now, as we mentioned, right, the the more is still growing, so we are allowed to put more uh, more stuff into our circuits. So actually, there are processor implementing perceptrons nowadays. But I will talk about that later. So, uh, but here is the so if you are given the perceptron predictor sufficient amount of budget, like four K, sixteen K, it actually outperforms other predictors. But uh, but if you just have 1K budget, then that's not enough for a perceptron to work well. And another interesting thing about perceptron is that the perceptron predictor you need, uh, you, uh, it's, it's, based, it's working better if you have a super long history. So like, uh, like, uh, like the, the case that we said, we need 20 bits to trend. The perceptron predictor can probably work very well. So, um, and, and as we mentioned, right, here, here are the predictors that has been used. So like uh, Pentan MMX, Pentan 2, Pentan 3. Well, so for a lot of you, when those processors are run, you are probably uh, not born yet, right? But uh, they have, uh, they, they have, the, and that was the, I will say these processors, they are probably like late 20th century or early 21st century. And they use a local four bit history predictor. So they are about the same time uh, when the perceptrons uh, predictors are introduced. However, because the te hardware technology doesn't allow us to do that. So um, uh, uh, at that time, right? The processor only have a local four bit history or a local pattern history table with 16 entries, just 16 entries for each conditional jump, right? And for pendant N core two and uh, atom processor, well, some of you might be familiar with that now because those are processors after 20, uh, in early 21st century. And they use, uh, they use the uh, uh, global branch predictors. And for a tournament predictor is used in digital alpha and AMD Aslan processors. There is an interesting history here, but we will talk about that more after uh, we talk about uh, the paper of digital alpha. And now with AMD's Ryzen processor, some of you might know it's a processor now uh, get the crown of the fastest uh, desktop processor. Uh, and uh, they use a percent based neural, uh, neural, neural range predictor and Samsung's mobile phone processor also use that. Right. So now because of the hardware technology allows us to put more circuits for branch prediction. So perceptron becomes work, an, an, a good idea again. So, so sometimes why we read papers because uh, some of the papers, they, uh, some of the idea are, were not implemented is not because of the idea is bad. It's just because it's too early. And being an engineer, you need the sensitivity to figure out there are uh, when the potential of implementing that is ready and integrated into your products, right? So that's why reading paper is a very important part, being a computer scientist, a computer engineer, even though you are not working for academia, you still have to read a lot of papers. Now, um, but being a programmer, right? Some of you are thinking about, okay, oh, well, I don't care. I just, want, I, I just want to write good programs. Branch is still important. So remember this sort, uh, this 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 demo we had in the very beginning, right? When I say we enable the sort, the performance is a lot better. So now, can you tell me exactly why?
All right, 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now according to your discussion, the most popular answer is C. Uh, however, well, according to my experience, uh, when when people chose C, is mostly like a branch prediction because you think C is should be the the most popular answer. So I want you guys to go into discussion and uh, uh, now. All right, let's wrap it in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now after discussion, well, the answer did change. So sounds like after discussion, you have more overlapping. So I would like to hear more about that. So let's pick a team to share your thoughts with us. Woohoo, instinct. Who is the scriber of team one today? Okay, so I have Vion. Yeah, hi, Professor. Yep. So uh, I think uh, the amount of branch misprediction will be smaller because the uh, amount of branch misprediction will be smaller because because uh, if the data is sorted, then uh, for the mm -hmm. if condition, most of the time mm -hmm. uh, in the in the beginning, your data will be smaller mm -hmm. than the threshold, and your branch mm -hmm. will not be taken. And once mm -hmm. it uh, exceeds the threshold, the branch will be taken all the time. Right. So, so uh, okay. How about others? So I was thinking about the first one, the dynamic instruction count. 
mm-hmm. is a lot smaller so basically if uh, we have uh, when option so, is not zero yes so um, i think the dynamic instruction count might reduce because uh, we might not have to check this if condition all the time so that particular part can be still be can removed. we skip that yes can we skip that why right so that should be skipped i think so how who can skip that basically you have the, to check it all the time right hmm. if the code is right there can you skip it uh we need to know the ba- uh, basically the data part uh, but if we know the data then we can i think we can skip the if condition checking all the time but how and, do you know if your branch prediction is correct or not so you cannot skip that hmm. okay right compiler optimization pro- can never skip that right and the hardware right. cannot skip that because because the programmer said that you have to check that and in fact if your option is not zero you need to execute a sort right so mm-hmm. the dynamic instruction will always be smaller so yeah it won't be it not. would be not larger it right? won't be smaller right but what you are saying is right with 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 sorting right then most most of the time our branch prediction will be correct so the third is correct however for the first one it's not correct right, right? Mm-hmm. and uh, the second one the branch instruction because you cannot skip them every of them you have to go through so it's about it's the same right right and mm-hmm. you still have to access this array right mm-hmm. and plus when you sort you have to access the data array again so it's actually more Okay. Right. So yeah. all the uh, so the first one and the fourth one is give you reasons why it's worse mm-hmm. not for the reason why it's better. The only reason why it's better is because of this. Right? And right. that's something that uh classes like uh algorithm won't tell you. Right, yeah. because there is no such a thing called branch prediction in algorithm class. But thanks to your answer, uh, I will give you half points. Right, but here is the thing: the total amount of instruction is unchanged. Now, I want to give you another question before we finish the lecture today. So uh, there is a question called pop count. It's also a branch related question that I want I want to demonstrate the effect of branch prediction. So uh, the pop count is that we want to count for a specific values, how many of them within their values are bits one. And it's a very useful uh, uh, application that uh, you can use in many, many, many things. So let's look at that. Uh, uh, let's look at that. So if I have a, uh, a question like this, because I know a lot of you like, uh, uh, I would say, uh, what's that? Uh, uh, leak code, right? So that's a reformat it as a leak code question. So I have, if I have a question like this, I want to count how many ones within the number, right? And for this number, uh, you know the output should be seven. Okay, so we have four different implementations here. And being a programmer, can you judge which one would you think would be the best performing.
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so now uh, let me share the result with you. So if today I am the interviewer of some company and then I say I want to select only the one uh, who, uh, who know how to write the fastest code, then uh, according to this result, probably only 11 of you will get elected. So now let me share uh, the demo with you. So here is the pop count code. And as you can see, here is the pop count. Uh, so I use a define and you can, uh, you can imagine that uh, the ABCD version, they are identical to the code that I give you. And now I compile all of them with dash O3 with exactly the same, uh, with exactly the same um, uh, com uh, compilation flag. So now let's run version A. So version A in uh, and, and here, uh, we are counting uh, like uh, how much, uh, 1 million numbers. And for version A, uh, for one, counting the number of bits in one, 1 million numbers, it would take a while, but how long is it? I have no idea because I, I, have running, I have been running all the words that I have. Okay, as you can see here, it takes 26 seconds, right? And now for version B, how much would it take? So for version B, right? The second version. For version A is the while X version. And for version B, it takes uh, 17 seconds, right? The version B is a while X version, but use shifts. It is faster and uh, uh, well, and also for version B, we kind of like on row, uh, loop iteration and four into a group. Now for version C, wow, a lot of you chose that one, right? It's actually pretty fast, six seconds. Now for the version D, the most ugly one, right? How much time will it take? It takes only 4.9 seconds, right? So now look at the code again, which I shared with you, right? It's the answer here is actually D is the fastest one, even though it looks like uh, uh, it looks so ugly and um, it has a for loop looks uh, very uh, redundant comparing with use while X, but there is a reason why it is faster and we will leave the, uh, the solution um, and the discussion regarding this uh, to the next lecture. And before you leave the classroom, one thing that I want to tell you, so reading quiz due Wednesday, don't forget about that. And uh, we have finished the midterm grading, the average is about 66 uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and this, and, and again, right, your overall final grade is decided based on a lot of things. So here's the current standing. So check the current uh, total uh, in your uh, I learn, not Canvas. Canvas is not a school. And uh, projected later grades. So, uh, and again, uh, right now we still have 50% of the grades to be offered. And even for the offered parts, only uh, there are still 25% your, uh, your assignments, reading quiz, you still have the time to boost them up. And here's the current uh, ranking of your score. You should be able to find where you are uh, the, by, uh, by logging into iLearn. And here's my current projection of your final grading, but it could change based on your uh, final exam, right? So I am planning to have this amount of people getting an A plus for this amount of people getting an A because you see there is a significant drop for the grades here. And here, there's also a somewhat significant here for A minus. And here you see another significant drop. So it will be the B plus and here we will have the B and here it will be a B minus portion. So um, if you think you want to improve, there is a chance to, well, there's a lot of potential for you to improve. And as I played a song in the very beginning, never really over, so you still have halfway to go. Uh, goodbye and enjoy the rest of, the, uh, of your day. I will see you on Wednesday.